Are we live? Let's see here. Uh, I'm going to put you in the holder. There we go. Let's see. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's right. Let's see here. Ah, okay. Am I on? Question mark. I'm gonna move this just a tad closer and get the horizon better. <laughs> this is all the stuff that editors take out, but we put it in. Yes, I'm on. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the cave. It's one o'clock Pacific time. I'm Adam Savage. And like I hope as many of you as humanly possible, I am on lockdown. Uh, the entire state of California went on lockdown yesterday. That is, uh, everyone's been asked to sequester in place. That is to stay in their homes and not leave, uh, except for critical things like groceries and gas and other things. Um, I truly hope you are following this, even if you are in a state in which they have not yet declared that. Um, social distancing is one of the most powerful ways we can flatten the curve of this thing. I will admit I am just as uh, scared as everybody. I'm reading up on this every day. Uh, I am now not leaving the house without gloves on and uh, a mask. I have, I, I have just enough masks for the family. And uh, yeah, so we're here in my cave to give you some place to go because I needed some place to go and I figured I'd share it with you. Uh, I, have, I spent a couple of hours yesterday working on a Ghostbusters kit. Uh, where is all that? Where did, I, where did I put all of my information? Ah, here it is under the laptop. All right. So um, what I am building is a giant put together model of the Ghostbusters emergency vehicle, the Ecto-1. When I am done, this literally will be this big. I cannot wait for that day despite the fact that that day is two years away in the most optimistic frame imaginable. So this is how large the Ecto-1 I'm building will be. It is all mechanically connected uh, and a bunch of parts arrive every month, um, usually a box or two from the, from the company, uh, from Hero Collector, Eagle Moss, uh, every month. And I've gotten uh, two months worth of kits so far. And I was just going to save them. I was going to put them up in deep storage until they'd all arrived. And then this seemed like a perfect opportunity to start building. And so I am. Yesterday, I was able to put together the headlight arrangement with the fog lights. And uh, I did a lot of weathering as I went. And if you want to see close up just how cool the uh, black oil paint looks on the chrome, how much depth and uh, uh, scale that it gives. Um, I noticed on the fog lights, these guys here, that there are there are bulb-shaped protrusions inside the fog lights, but no actual lights. And funnily enough, there are lights in the picture. Well, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure if that means they're going to send me new replacements for the for the backs of these lights and that I put those in later. I don't know. But the fact is I'm here and I have some little bulbs. These are pre-resistored 12 volt bulbs. I have a whole bunch of them and I had four in orange and I decided to actually uh, drill out the back of one of these fog light reflectors and sock in one of these little bulbs. Uh, all right, so I have a power supply on the other side of this workbench. It's set to just over 12 volts. So we're just going to do a little power test on this and make sure that it works. Oh, test your circuitry, circuitry every time. How's that? Hey, look at that. That is a light that lights. What could be better? <laughs> I look I'm taking all the simple pleasures I can get at this point um, but anybody who is a veteran of lots of different electronics projects knows that a light that lights is a delightful thing indeed um, so I was going to start by painting the, 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 the engine parts that I've got 
but I'm actually going to start by installing four of these bulbs in the reflectors of the fog lights, and then we'll go from there. How was everybody's night last night? Uh, I, I, we have, so we've done a bunch of things to hopefully, um, wow, how does that fit in there? Uh, we've done a bunch of, sorry, I should say, yesterday when I tried streaming, we had a lot of trouble with the streaming. Uh, it was cutting out all the time, buffering all the time. Uh, even my mom complained. Hi, mom. Um, today, we are trying a bunch of different things. I am using a different Wi-Fi network. My phone had latched on to uh, the, another Wi-Fi network by accident. Um, so we're trying a different Wi-Fi network. We have turned off chat, which is not totally ideal, I recognize, but it is a potential source of the problem. So we've tried to eliminate that. And then um, we've done a couple of other things. I've shut out all the, the uh, what do you call it? The, the apps on my laptop, which is also on this network. So now there's nothing on this network but this phone. And if we're lucky, we're going to be able to stream together for a solid two hours. If we're not, well, we'll figure something else out. I'm hoping to be able to stream from something other than my phone at some point in the future. Um, we'll see. So now I've got to get all the way in here. Ah, there we go. So we're going to install this, and then we're going to take a look at it behind once it's installed just to see how we like it. So again, do a little power test here. That's the ground. Here comes the hot lead. I got a hot lead. Look at that. Look at that. There we go. I can't actually even see it in the camera. All right, here, let's hold this up so you can see. I don't even know what that was that just fell down, but I'll figure that out in a second. Yeah, that looks great. I'm very, very happy with that. Oh, it's my bandsaw. Oh, great. I'm hearing that this looks good. I'm very pleased about that. Ugh. You know, it's funny about the tools that you keep common to your like your main squeeze, your main workbench. Because, like, look, makers, we all have different shops. We all have different spaces, big and small. And in those spaces, we end up with different work surfaces that we like and we don't like. Um, and we gravitate towards some. This right here is my main squeeze as a workbench. And it may change. Uh, Recently, my mom located my grandfather's original woodworking bench. My grandfather, in addition to being a surgeon, was also a, a woodworker and did a lot of stuff in their house. Um, and his workbench top, which is similar to this one, a big, thick piece of wood with a vise and I think some uh, dog holes along it, uh, will eventually become my main workbench. But right now, it's this one that I bought on um, – I can't remember. I think I bought this on Etsy. Um, I have since covered it. Chris at ClickSpring inspired me to cover my bench with a piece of uh, seven ounce uh, veg tanned uh, leather, which is a great surface. It's really nice. Uh, it's a great surface to work on. It doesn't harm my tools. Um, yeah, I'm really digging it. Anyway, I'm going on way too long about this, but what I was going to say was this workbench, because it's like my mission critical workbench, has a lot of tools that are on regular use. For instance, I've got all my uh, my combination squares, my start, uh, my dovetail things, little tiny uh, 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 angle finders and things like this. And then below that, what do we have? We've got some trowels and, oh yeah, the bench dogs. Below that, I have planes all set out nicely. Yeah, I'll show you the plane drawer. Hold on just a second. Here, let's um, let's go. Let's, we're gonna we're trying some. Now that the streaming seems to be working, I'm gonna try moving around the cabin a little bit. Here is the drawer in which I store my. Oh, let's do a reveal. Here's the drawer in which I store my planes. Ah, oh, isn't that satisfying? Everything in its place. Everything with a home. Isn't that nice? It just fills me full of calm just to. Just look at it. Uh, all right. That's, there we go. Oh, all right. Um, and then at the bottom, I have uh, some really nice chisels that are kept super sharp. But hanging to the side of my workbench is this guy. And I like, I know that may seem extreme, 
But honestly, the cordless portable bandsaw is just one of the greatest tools ever invented. I love this thing so much. I bought the very first one. I think the first one that was made was in Milwaukee with their 28 volt battery. Um, I still have that one, although the batteries crapped the bed a long time ago. This is a DeWalt. This is DeWalt's big one. They make a small one. Uh, and now I think most companies make a cordless and corded version of the portable bandsaw. There's just, uh, if you came up like I did, cutting metal with a big um, uh, uh, abrasive wheel chop saw, the, yeah, the, the horrendous sound. Oh, my God. I mean, I just think back to building the bathrooms at George Coates Performance Works in on at 110 McAllister on Market Street in the early 90s, 1990, 1991, cutting dozens and dozens and dozens of pieces of two-inch thick wall steel for these 20-foot tall stalls that David Ireland designed. That sound just haunts my dreams. And I own two of those chop saws, and I keep giving them away. I had four, and I gave two away because I just can't stand them. Because after you cut steel with this, here's the sound of it at full speed. That is so gentle. And you, I cut through a piece of bronze yesterday, cut through steel, cut through brass, aluminum, whatever you want. Nice and gentle. I still haven't done the thing that a lot of people do, which is to make an upright stand for this so it sits on your workbench, which is really dumb of me because I actually have a need for that on a frequent basis and I haven't gotten around to it. And honestly, maybe that's a build I do next week while streaming with you. Um, that was a hell of a derail. Let's get back to uh, installing these fog lights. Okay, so... Uh, I'm going to pull out that. That was a successful test of that one. And I I guess. Oh. Okay. So I've got this thing where the. Uh, 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 I might run into fitment issues later on about this. Because I've got this uh, heat shrunk part below the bulb. Below the bulb right here. And it doesn't like. I may end up with a piece of the bumper of the actual car that that gets in the way of. But before I start bending that to get out of the way, I don't think that's a problem I'm going to worry about solving until I actually need to solve it. So let's pull out the second one and see if we can get a nice little assembly line going here. Uh, there's one screw. Um, I like being precise, but one thing you don't know about me is I'm ridiculously clumsy. I like drop stuff all the time. Um, like I was eating some chips and dip last night while talking to my wife and my mom. And I was just holding on to this ramekin of, um, salsa, papalote salsa, if you must know my favorite salsa. And uh, I was just holding on to this ramekin of salsa and dipping a chip into it. And somehow I just like leapt out of my hands and the ceramic ramekin dropped on the floor and sprayed papalote salsa everywhere. Um, really, the tragedy of this story is that I lost some papalote salsa in the in the melee that that that's the tragedy that's what you should feel sorry for me about okay uh i'm gonna do this one at a time so i don't dismantle everything normally i like to assembly line stuff but um these these pieces were tricky enough to get in in the right orientation that i'm not going to do that so now that i've got this you see it's got this little nubbin there you see the nubbin there you go okay so there's a nubbin i would like I'd like my bulbs to be accurately placed. And on the first one off camera, uh, I drilled it from the back trying to get it close, but that wasn't perfect. So I'm actually going to try snipping this one with my flush cutters. Um, I mean, if I mark up the reflector, that's still not a tragedy because, again, this Ecto-1 is beat up. Uh you know, wet, stuff that's weathered and heavily used, you can hide a lot of crimes. That's the phrase. You can hide a lot of crimes. Okay. So now we're going to try drill. Actually, I think I may need to hold on to this just a little more securely. Uh, I can't remember if we did a tested video on this. This is a uh, really nice jeweler's clamp. I think we did do a tested video. I just don't think, I'm not sure if we've released it re yet. Um, but this is a 
tested jeweler's clamp. So it's two halves on a rocker. And I grab the piece I want to work on in the jaws. And then I use a, a wedge on the bottom. There we go. To give myself uh, some holding power. And then I don't have to hold, I don't have to hold something tiny with my fingers while I'm drilling it, which as you can imagine, has been a very common source of injury over the course of my life. Was that my door knocking? Just a second. I'm just going to double check that. Let's see. Was it the door? Damien? Were you knocking? Okay, cool. Oh, Maggie, don't you bark. Okay, here we go. Back into it. Okay. Uh, that was not the front door. That was just me being hard of hearing. Um, a really nice note about drilling holes carefully, um, which is a, 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 a lot of cordless, most cordless tools have a variable speed uh, drive. So you can turn the drill very slowly. And this is actually really key, especially for model parts, because what you can do with that is you can start, and once you get purchase, you can actually angle the drill to kind of aim that aim that hole. If you think of the tip of a drill as a um, as a wedge like this, uh, I'm I'm tip. I somehow forgot how to spell tip there. Uh, if you think of a tip of a drill as like a wedge like this, right? And that's about the angle that the drill is at. And what that wedge describes is two cutting edges that are spinning and peeling off bits of plastic or metal as you're drilling it. Well, the fact is, is that if you're drilling straight, it's just peeling from both, but you actually have a lot of room to be able to re-aim where that hole goes. And you have, to be honest, a lot more latitude than you think you do. Um, this is something I didn't always know, but more recently have found that, um, if I see that a, a hole is going off angle, I can actually redirect it. Um, and, you know, if you set up work right and you use center drills and you're marking and laying out correctly, well, that's usually not a problem. But if you're, um, if you're, uh, you know, <laughs> if you like working fast like me and you don't do setup every single time, you can end up getting yourself into some trouble. So all that was a long way of saying you can actually aim your drill bit as you're drilling if you're careful there we go so now we're almost all the way through and again i'm you know once it breaks through the other side it's going to grab and it's going to pull itself through oh it's doing good ah oh yep it grabbed it oh it's not that bad okay so now I've got my um, got my reflector with a hole in it. I'm just going to clean up the edges of that hole with an exacto. <laughs> then we're going to pop a bulb in the back. Oh, let's make sure this bulb works before we glue it. Why not? I can't even tell you. If you're doing anything with electronics, my main there it is. That one lights up, so we're good. Actually, let's do the other two while we're here, and then I don't have to keep doing this. Whenever you're doing electronics. The more often you can test your rig as you're putting it together, the better off you are. Seriously, at every stage, success, at every stage you should be testing your electronics. Every time you're attaching another part to the build, man, because there's nothing worse than thinking you're done. That one's good too. There's nothing worse than thinking you're done. <laughs> and then turning the thing on and it doesn't work. I've been there so many times. Boy, does it suck, but boy, have I been there so many times. Okay, so now I'm going to suck it in. I measured this with my calipers, and it came out to like 1.15 inches. So I grabbed an eighth-inch drill bit. That's 1.25. Give me a little bit of latitude. And I'm throwing a little bit of CA glue. Now, normally I've been using this aerosolized uh, accelerator. However, a couple of days ago... 
I put together a house toolkit. Uh, as you can imagine, I packed many of my favorite and most useful tools uh, in case there was a point in the future at which I was not able to leave my house. So some of my things are not here, including my aerosolized uh, 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 zip kicker. <laughs> uh, all right, that one's good. Let's get this in here. Let's see, does it go like that? It does. Okay. Oh, now it doesn't even want, uh, now it doesn't even want to sit correctly. You know what? I think I'm going to pre-put in the screws and try that. Try bringing it close. There is so much parity between, to me, the idea of being a, ah, a model maker and <laughs> performing surgery. I, I don't know why, but I mean, no, I do know why. I mean, it always feels like this, right? Like surgeons, especially the ones who work on bones and stuff, I mean, they're using so many of the same tools and techniques. I'm like fascinated by that. Uh, I had a relative who had a fixator on their bones and uh, I was just completely fascinated by the technology. Uh, there it is. There's another one. Okay, let's light them both up and to get, yeah, I think I can get both in one clip. Let's light them both up. Um, the other reason to light stuff up as you're going is morale. Uh, you know, I say this in the book a lot, but momentum is super key to, 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 to making. Oh, look at that. So nice. Now, here's the thing. You can actually buy these. We'll, we'll, we'll find the link and put these up. You can buy these bulbs. Normally, when you're using, let's see. Ah, uh, normally, when you're using LEDs, you need to add a resistor in line to the power supply uh, to meter out the amount of power going to the LED. But you can also buy LEDs that are pre-wired and heat shrunk with a resistor built in. So all you need is, hook, is to hook them up to 12 volts of power. Um, and this is great for the uh, electronically challenged. I am electronically challenged. I, I like understand electronics like I understand mechanics, which is to say, you know, medium well. Um, but I'm frequently calling Jeremy Williams for advice and support when I get out into the weeds, which is anytime I get past like switches. <laughs> Uh, as soon as I get to any kind of active circuits that need all sorts of different kinds of metered power, I'm a little bit lost. Luckily, I have always uh, had people that I could call. Um, more frequently, I've had people that I could call. Okay, there's both screws and there's that guy. I'm going to label the... Yeah, just give it a key. Honestly, labeling your stuff as you take it apart, so completely vital. Um, the, one, of the, one of the other techniques that I like, and actually this kit is laid out this way, is to lay out your parts in the order that they're going together or the order that they came out. Um, and this is actually, Robert Piercing talks about this technique in Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. He talks about taking apart a motorcycle engine and laying the pieces out. Uh, like when you pull out five bolts, you lay them on the towel in the order you put them in. Just like everything gets laid out in the way that it was oriented as it was attached to the machine. That is a very, very useful technique. Okay. Slice the nubbin. This flush cutter does a pretty good job of getting to the bottom of that. Uh, uh, and again, you can also like, you can also use your finger to support the drill bit. It's not going to cut you at a, at a slow speed. Um, okay. Come on. Not, okay. Good. That was not being initially as cooperative as the first one. Um, but I persevered and I just let it scrape away some material. And again, oh yeah, you know what? I wanted to talk about why the black paint does such a neat job on the chrome. And it has to do with shininess 
and the reality and the fantasy of shininess. Ah, and I'll put it this way. Uh, they had the golden, okay, picture the golden idol from Raiders. Wait, you don't have to, hold on. I'll get a, I'll get a teaching aid. Uh, let's see, over here to the Raiders self. This is a pretty good one. Um, let's see. All right. So if you uh, if you picture the Raiders idol like this, uh, and this is a pretty good model. It's got uh, glass eyes. It actually separates like what the real one did on set. Um, one of the ones they built for the film had movable eyes. Um, but what I want to talk about is the shininess of this. On film, something this chromy actually ends up kind of disappearing on film. It's not that it disappears, but it's that it's so shiny, your eye doesn't have any idea what it's looking at. And it takes a minute to sort of parse it in layers. Whereas the moment you, and I, I don't actually have one that's weathered because my other idol's at home in my home office. Um, but the moment you add weathering, the moment you add darkness into the corners, what you're starting to do is actually make details more visible. Um, and so... <sighs> Funnily enough, on Raiders, they actually had the idols chrome-plated, but for the scene where Bellic holds it up, that one's been sprayed with dulling spray. It's not much shinier than gold spray paint in that shot because it was so reflective, they needed to kill some of that reflectivity in order to make it look properly reflect reflective on camera. Um, I have an example, and I think I can actually post some pictures of this. I have an example of my um, Rocketeer backpack. When I, uh, I built a Rocketeer backpack from Acme's kit, um, and it's stunning. It's a beautiful piece. And I had it, I actually had it metal plated. I sent it to a plater and it's got a heavy nickel and chrome plating and it's heavy. Like it's an amazing piece. But when I first got it back from the plater, I was so excited to open this box. I was thinking this, it's a, it's the Sirius X one, man. It's going to be metal. It's going to look so amazing. And I opened it and it was so disappointed because it didn't look great at all. It was way too shiny. Um, yeah, I will. Kristen Norm will make a note. We can post this uh, on Twitter after the feed. Um, I had to take down the shine of the metal plating because it looked awful, genuinely awful. And I wouldn't have called that. It was like this whole education in one moment. And so then I realized, okay, well, I've got to kill the shine. And so I grabbed some, uh, some, uh, scotch bright, uh, you know, the green scrunch on your sponge, that's uh, a 3M material called scotch bright. We buy it in shops in many different grades, uh, for different hardnesses and different kinds of polish. And so I grabbed some of the standard brown stuff I use and it wasn't making a dent in the chrome. And that's when I realized why they chrome plate stuff, because chrome is a really hard coating. And actually taking down the shine of my Rocketeer backpack took hours and hours and hours of the most exhausting scrubbing with the hardest of the Scotch-Brite pads. Yeah, it was a total nightmare. I'll post those afterwards. All right, so we got a nice hole in that. Let's put a, put the bulb in. Yeah. Oh, good. It's a press fit. That's what I really like. I like the press fits. Oh, ah, ah. See? Clumsy, I tell you. Not everyone loves the smell of this stuff, of the zip kicker. I personally love it. But that's not to say it's good for you. <laughs> All right. Let's get this in here. I'm really looking forward to to actually moving on with this build. Is that how that one goes? Yes, it is. Okay, I had good success. I'm looking forward to getting to the transmission of this because I got this great picture of a old, greasy, rusty transmission bell housing, and I am going to replicate that puppy. I'm going to make it look super old. I'm looking forward to my engine compartment to feeling very familiar you know, to a mechanic. Um, all right, get in there. Oh, 
Good. Come on. That's it. Nope. Nope. You're not in. There you are. Excellent. Okay. Three out of four. Ah. Oh. The other thing about doing building and weathering the Millennium Falcon kit in situ when I was making it is that so many people were releasing so many additions to that kit in etched brass and form printed stuff and injection molded stuff and extra sticker packs. My God, the fan community was so amazing on the D'Agostini Millennium Falcon, but amazing. Sorry. Amazing, but also totally overwhelming. There was like way too many options and I was like overwhelmed by them because it's like it was hard to keep up with what people were generating. And of course, like I'm a completist, so I kind of want to know everything that people are doing. And sometimes if I can see that I won't be able to wrap my head around something simply, I kind of like will stay away from it. And I, I sort of did that. I was like trying to wrap my head around the fan community for the Falcon and what they were building. At the same time, I was like, man, I'm never going to get to the bottom of this. And I can't just keep ordering everybody's kits. It's like, <laughs> you know, that gets expensive after a while. All right. Nubbin, gone. Um, by the way, these little Makita no longer makes these specific 12 volt drills. Um, I know that people have talked about the ones they're currently making as fine. I don't know. Um, but man, I just love how how lightweight these are. They're not super powerful, but that's again a function of their size. But they're great. Sorry, I have to cough. <coughs> okay. Oh. I have a couple of spectacular injuries from drills over the years. A couple of weeks ago, I was sharing some gross pictures with Ann Wheaton because I lost this fingernail. Right. You guys saw it on the videos. I, 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 I smashed my middle finger trying to hammer a piece of wood under the back tire of my Land Cruiser um, the day that it got stolen. Good God. That feels like months ago, but it was... December 28th. It's not that long ago at all. Um, at any rate, yeah, I, I smashed my middle finger and it looked horrendous for a while. And then it uh, it looked even worse. And then it looked worse than that. And then the nail fell off. Yes, of course I kept the nail. No, I have not shown it to anyone yet. <laughs> I have all of my kids' baby teeth. You know that? Every time one of them lost a tooth, I kept it. I'm a collector. I'm I'm weird that way. I just I, I, I like having all the all the detritus. At one point we came back from our friend's farm in Petaluma um, and had to do a, a de ticking. We had to take all the ticks off the dogs because uh, it was that particular season up there and I pulled fourteen off of Huxley. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. Um, and, you know, I get really into repetitive, tedious tasks like that. So I pulled all 14 ticks off of Huxley. And then I was like, this is fabulous. And I had them. I had this, <laughs> this, like, this dumb screw top glass test tube that was about that long, about that long, about five inches long and about an inch and a quarter in diameter. And I just kept on pulling out the ticks and with a pair of tweezers, I drop them in. So these ticks were all sort of like doing a battle royale inside this test tube. And I was like, oh, let me show this to, let me show this to one of my kids because kids love gross things and they'll think this is hilarious. And so I brought thing two over to my office and I was like, dude, check this out. And I like held up this test tube of ticks sealed. And that's when I discovered that Thing 2 has a phobia of dicks. He literally was like, ah! Oh, he was so unhappy. I felt terrible. I didn't, I, that was not the thing I was hoping to elicit. I was just excited I had 14 of them in one place. Maybe he didn't even know that uh, he was, didn't like ticks until that second when he saw them all and was like, 
man, that is gross. Look, I know everyone thinks that's gross, but still, it's also kind of cool. This is why I love um, the, 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 this is why one of the reasons I love grad student Twitter, I follow a lot of grad students on Twitter who are doing field research um, on birds and lizards and other things. And I love the, I love the gross stuff that turns out to be really fascinating. All right. Let's one screw in. Let's get the other one anchored. Come on. Mm. You know, I was engaging in Twitter the other day on a description, a discussion between the Phillips screws drive system, the cross, and the um, Robertson drive, uh, which is square, which is different than square drive. That makes me crazy. There are square drives and there are Robertson, which also happen to be square. Um, and woe betide you if you get them mixed up because square drives, one of the two can get stuck in the other in a way that's really egregious. Okay, now we have all four fog lights installed. We, uh, we can test them, I guess. I wonder if I can get all four lines on a single. No, I think I'm gonna have to. Well, let's, let's try it. Oh, that's not the one. Okay, let's see if I can get all four on a single clasp. This is, again, this right here, this is me being lazy, right? Like, I could just grab my wire strippers and go, and then I'd be sure that it wouldn't work. But I always want to try the quick and dirty solution first. I mean, maybe this is a remnant of what I learned from Jamie Heineman. I mean, the thing about Jamie and the reason what makes Jamie such an awesome engineer is he does not reject any idea out of hand, even based on his own intuition or institutional knowledge, um, he does not prioritize his own intuition, which is kind of amazing because it allows for a tremendous lack of bias. Uh, and, and he is looking for the popsicle stick and boogers solution that would make it work. Um, all right. Hey, look at that. We already have some lights. I think that looks beautiful. That is a nice, successful modification. First thing off the bat. And what do you want to bet that there's going to be a, a, a replacement for these reflectors at some point in the future? And then I'll have to redo this, but I don't care. That's fine. Uh, all right. Now I can put this away. I don't need that there. I can move down there. Um, I don't think I need that. Or... Um, as I move around the shop on the chair and like go check stuff out. Awesome. Uh, what did someone send me? Oh, oh, oh. sorry. Friend sending me an email. As I move around the shop, um, on this chair, I'll tell you who I feel like. I feel like the old man from Witness. Uh, 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 what's her name? The girl's father. Uh, that, uh, that 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 Harrison Ford's character, John Book, stays with. Uh, and they're Amish or they're Mennonites. I don't want to get it wrong, but I really can't remember exactly. Uh, I think the catch-all of Amish is not necessarily as accurate as it should be. Uh, however, uh, they live in uh, that part of Pennsylvania, and obviously, uh, as such, they eschew modern technology and don't have any, except the old guy has this chair, and he's like serving dinner around the house on this rolling chair because, hey, wheels, I love that. It's a, it's a, it, it was a good laugh when the film came out. All right, so now we are assembling the gearbox and bell housing for the transmission of the Ecto-1. That's gonna go, that's gonna go over here. And we've got some parts and some pieces. And I will tell you, uh, after downloading, here's one of the pieces. And this is actually, uh, this is actually cast metal. Um, but the thing I really like about it is it's not an inaccurate blue actually uh i've downloaded a whole bunch of pictures of late 50s cadillac engines and some pictures of the engine compartment 
of some specifically 1959 Miller Meteor uh, uh, caddies. And sure enough, yeah, this this color is is pretty darn close. So they've done a ah, that was a little fast. They've done a lot of my work for me. Is this lamp annoying anyone? No. There, there we go. Better. Better. Uh, so that's great that they've actually done some of that work for me. Okay. Let's pull these pieces out and let's start assembling them. And then we're going to get into weathering. Oh, right. So let me show you the picture I have. So here is a picture of the part that I'm, I'm <laughs> this seems surreal that I'm showing a laptop to a phone so that you can look at it on your computer or phone. All right. Here is the beautiful transmission I found from a late 50s Cadillac in the correct color. You'll notice there that that color is not too dissimilar from that. I know this looks darker, but uh, trust me, I think it's actually pretty darn close. Um, we are going to, uh, we, me, me are going to uh, assemble it and I'm also going to weather it and paint it. And this is actually some great opportunity to talk about uh, uh, things you can do to get even more scale out of your scale parts. Um, for instance, like these are two halves of the uh, of the gearbox that go onto this thing. Um, and my recommendation is going to be, and I'm going to actually follow this, is not to assemble all three of these together, but to paint them as two separate parts because uh, that saves me from having to mask later. I keep touching this earbud because it's, it's annoying me. I think, oh, I think I may have to uh, go get my AirPod case and put a slightly larger rubber thing. You can still hear me, right? Well, someone will text me if I can't be heard. Pretty sure I can. Um, all right, so the first part is actually this thing. Uh, insert the long end of the bell housing connector. What? Oh, whoops. Sorry. That's the first part. And then there is this guy, which is different than that guy. Okay. So I don't need to cover. I don't need to hide my work under a bushel. I can show you what I'm doing. That goes like that. This is bilaterally symmetrical. There is no orientation that matters. So he goes there and he gets screwed in with two DM screws. D-E-D-M. One, two, three. I'll just pull out. Yeah, I'll pull out what I need. Uh, there we go. Ah, but, but, but. How does this look? How does this end? Oh, I see. Okay, that part gets buried. So yeah, I can install that without painting it. Um, oh, you know, I went to... Oh, comes from the inside. Um, I was uh, walking Maggie yesterday afternoon uh, past Dolores Park, which is near my house. And... Uh, uh, a little uncomfortable with how many people were out and about, to be honest. Um, it was a beautiful day, and you know, Dolores Park on a beautiful day is a is a a pretty amazing place. But holy hell, people, we're supposed to be practicing social distancing, and um, there was like a few hundred people in Dolores Park. A few hundred, maybe maybe two hundred people. I don't know. It's a little more than I was comfortable with. All right, come on. Wow. I think they really only half threaded most of these holes so that you're kind of like doing this last wedge fit as you plow it past the pot metal. Okay, so that's step one. Moving on to step two. Ah, okay, here's that other piece. And that piece goes, this seems like a convoluted bit of engineering. This piece goes through like that. That's the, sometimes I see parts on these kits that it's like, 
you literally just oh they're all dm screws for these steps so uh one two three four five six seven eight wait one two three four nope 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 they're dms and ems okay i'm gonna stop trying to make efficiencies let's pull out what i need so uh two dm screws in the back of that Mm. I hope that all your friends and family are safe. Um, I only have one person I know who seems to have contracted the virus, but that will change over the next few weeks. But that's, uh, you know, look, we're all reading up on this all the time. Uh, it's not something I have to talk about here. This is, this is we're doing some self-soothing here. Hey, here's a piece of advice. Don't look at the news uh, after like 8 or 9 p.m., man. That way lies madness. You need your sleep. You need your sleep. This is really key. At this point in time, our stress levels are elevated. And that also um, harms our immune systems when our stress is elevated. And so one of the best things you can do for your stress level is making sure you're getting enough sleep if that is an option for you. It's, a, it's, it's real. Uh, so I hope you are getting enough sleep. Let's see here. Okay. E M E M E M. Those are three E M screws. Okay. So that goes, huh? Yeah. Just like that. All right. E M one, two, three. Yeah. Three, one, two, Ooh, too many. One time. I'm a, I'm a big believer <clears throat> that if I need three screws, I get four just because like you can be holding on to something and it can drop. And frankly, if I dropped a screw this big on this floor, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't find it. Uh, this floor eats things um, for breakfast. And uh, there's a, a, a showdown Jamie and I had on set once. He was like up on this crane I think he was up on this crane building something. And he was like, Dory, hand me six one inch quarter 20 screws. And I knew that Jamie had six holes to bolt through up there. And I was like, Tori, grab seven or eight. And Jamie was like, no, Tori, get me six screws. And I was like, all right. And Tori hands him six screws. And Jamie pulls out the first one, goes Doink! Bloop! right into the water. Oh, it was delightful to be so vindicated. Okay, <clears throat> let's see here. Now I have that. Now I turn this around and I, what's rattling? Oh, ooh, that's rattling. That's bad. Okay, I have to pull that apart and tighten those two screws. Clearly, I didn't tighten it up enough. Oh, right. And now I'm about to actually, mm, I'm about to paint these guys which means I may not want to add that next step until I've gotten some rust textures on here. Ooh, and I've got some good rust textures. I, um, ooh, ah, when, uh, you might not know this, but Jamie Heineman, Jamie Heineman's shop, I can see this a little better. Hold on. Ah, there we go. Oh. Love this little table. Uh, Jamie Heineman worked on Monkey Bone, um, did a bunch of beautiful props for Henry Selleck's film, Monkey Bone. And uh, he used a ton of Floquil weathering paints for that production. And when he uh, when we closed down the Mythbusters shop, he was actually getting rid of a whole bunch of it. So I have a whole bunch of really nice Floquil weathering like dust and concrete and dirt and grime and railroad tie down like all these colors specifically to weathering train sets and they're in the floquil lacquer which like look you know lacquers uh it's really hard to use lacquers in the state of california they're highly volatile they're dangerous to work with they off gas like a mofo um and I miss them. I miss them so much. Lacquers are just so great to spray. They dry like that. Oh, they're, they're, there was this primer, Plastic Coat with a K, Plastic Coat, 
Uh, you can still get it, just not in California. I have some old cans here that are so old that particulate in them has settled to the bottom. And in order to use them, you can't just shake them up. You actually have to soak them in warm water for like 90 minutes and shake them every 10 minutes or so while you're doing it to break up all the particulate. And even then they still clog all the time. It's a total nightmare. Okay. <sighs> time for painting. I have no idea actually what time it is. How are we doing here? Oh, we're almost done with our first hour. How cool. All right, uh, let's see. So the bell housing is a lot less weathered than that metal part. I'm gonna get some dirt and grime on there. Let's see, some dust. And I'll pull out some of the Barnard clay. And I'll move this over here. I've got some Ah. Grime, excellent. Oh. In a real like working model shop, like a big one, like Jamie's or ILM, there's often a rack of floquil paints that you can draw from. I've got one of some Tamiya over there that I bought um, a few years ago. It's still serving me well, but there's just nothing like a complete rack of all the colors of floquil to uh, to make a model maker's heart sing, honestly. Uh, so those are two DM screws. Before I forget where they go, I'm gonna put them there. All right. Uh, let me get, oh, these files are for the other thing I was working on. Okay. I've got dust and I've got, Dust and grime. Okay, there's dust and there's grime. Let's um, get those stirred up. Oh yeah, there's still a lot of stuff on the bottom here. Get that part okay. On these old paints, you just, you can't stir them too much. You just gotta keep on going. Oh yeah, let's get that. Oh, that smell, that smell of lacquer thinner. It's not good for you. No, I know it's not good for you. Um, my boy, it smells good. <laughs> I mean, you get affection for the stuff, even sometimes when it's awful smelling just because of what it can do. Um, and don't worry if I was spraying this, I would be wearing a mask. Um, it, you know, it feels weirdly appropriate right now that I collect spacesuits as a hobby because I feel like I'm not too far from wearing one out in public on a daily basis. Okay, we have some dust and we have some grime. And then we have uh, mention black, no. Uh, railroad tie brown. Uh, maybe, some, uh, maybe some burnt umber here. Let's get a little bit of that going. Uh, right, got some rub and buff. Ivory black. Is this still soft? Oh, yeah, that's still plenty soft. Uh, burnt sienna. We'll go for that. Excellent. Uh, oh, you know what I need? I need one of the most important painting tools there is. Blow dryer. Yeah, super, super fabulous. The Industrial Light and Magic Painting Room. So awesome. So awesome. Such a such a fabulous scene. Uh, sitting there in the spray booth with Lauren and Melanie and Peggy. And all the incredible paints that I got to work with there. Uh, and you'd be sitting there painting and painting and painting. And then with the blow dryer, drying and drying and drying. Everyone's telling stories and blow drying and painting. Just on and on and on. Uh, Super delightful. Right. Okay. If I'm going to be using the floquil, I need the lacquer thinner out. Let's get some of that. Uh, lacquer thinner. No. Acetone. There it is. Okay. And I want a cup for it. The wax one will do. Let's see. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, paper towels. Okay, so 
Just making sure I have enough to clean my brushes. You live there. Oh, you actually can go back in there. Huh. And which brushes? You know, these heavy acid brushes may be perfect for this. Let's try it. Let's try a little grime. Let's just see what we get out of this. Um, yeah, I'm just going to really, really, yeah, grime it up. Um, that's a brush I don't need to clean. See, what did I tell you? Clumsy. Clumsy, I tell you. Okay, because I'm clumsy. Where did where 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 did where, where did I put my um? Oh, I put it back. And here I thought I didn't want my jeweler's clamp anymore, but I did. I do. All right, so we're gonna do this. Great. And look at that. So ah. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is awesome. The um the lacquer dries quickly and it's flashing well. So I'm doing a base layer here now of the grime. And this is just accumulated dirt. That's all that it is. This is like, you know, the kind of sun-drenched crap that your car collects. And then we're going to hit it with a little bit more some irregular Irregular spots of it, right? Like I'm not trying. The, often I do a first weather pass that's 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 somewhat uniform, just to give myself a base to play with, uh, and then I do a second one, and that's where I add the randomness. It's really important to remember that as human beings, we are really shite at making things look random. Yeah. All right. So the grime is good. I'm going to now go for, um, I'm going to go for some of the dust. Oh, see, I don't think that's mixed up enough, actually. Let me see. I think I've got to stir this up a little bit more. It's just. Trying desperately to shake paint without looking suggestive at all. Yeah, we want to be a kid friendly, kid friendly stream here. Oh. This uh, this little cart here that I'm rolling around, I just picked I just picked this up on Craigslist. Um, it's basically uh, like a doctor's medical equipment cart, uh, and it's got like <laughs> honestly what looks like a 16 inch baking tray just bolted to the top of it which it might actually be um it's terrific for uh for portable tool surface around the shop okay let's see if that gets me something a little bit better okay so this is a much more subtle paint color Yeah, it's a little thinner. It's meant, I think, to not take over a paint job, but to still make it look, yeah. Okay, we'll try drying that. I may pull that back off. The really nice thing about lacquer is if you mix it real thin, properly mix it to very thin paint, which means it settles into the um, interstices. It settles into the tiny corners and it lends great detail. Um, model makers tend to really like certain model making companies' castings. For instance, I love Tamiya uh, because the precision of their castings means that when I add a, a black wash to a Tamiya model, I just know that it is going to, um, I just know it's going to look awesome. I know it's going to settle in and pull out all these details I didn't see before because the folks at Tamiya have like paid careful attention to the accuracy and the crispness of their of their tooling. Um, 
And lacquers are fantastic for exactly that, for exactly, uh, all right. I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going heavy on this, but I think it's really appropriate. This is a, this is a, again, if it's a total crap show and I, and I bone this, I can just pull the paint job back. I can put a little bit of lacquer thinner on a, on a rag and uh, immediately start pulling that paint job off. And honestly, at that point, it's probably gonna look fantastic. Um, again, my weather pass here is fairly monochromatic because both of these dust and grime are a fairly similar color. And given that, I'm actually gonna retire dust. I'm not that interested in it. I don't need that subtlety. I can get it myself. And yeah, there's a million different blow dryers. I don't know why I still love the Conair Pro Yellow Bird. It's just, to me, this is like the Ur blow dryer. That's why when, uh, when Michael Stevens and I could bring candy around the country, uh, and we made a hovercraft on stage every night, the key thing was that it uh, be powered by the yellow blow dryers. All right. I'm feeling pretty good about that as a first pass. Now I want to do these guys. So this is even heavier duty. So I'm going to go real heavy on these. And I'm going to actually use my piece of paper here. Ah! Exacto blade. <clears throat> yes, I have had an exacto roll off the table and embed itself in my shoe. We all have. <laughs> This is part of a rite of passage. I actually, at one point, I was working as a graphic designer in New York. It was probably 80, 87, 88. And I dropped an X-Acto blade and I went to pick it up. And as I picked it up, I was not looking where I was going. I was sort of looking away and I picked it up and drove it right up to its hilt in the back of my calf. I still have this little keloid scar you can see. That's the thing about many injuries is the ignominy, the, the, the shame of how dumb the injury was, why it exists. All right, let's get these guys on here, and we're just going to mix this up a little more. And we're just going to douse them. Yeah. Yeah, we're just, we're totally going to cover this. Because why the hell not? Then we'll blow dry it. And if we have to, we'll pull it back off. But it's going to get a second brown pass as well of some rust as in addition to this. And I'll probably do a second pass of this exact paint. Starting to spray around and actually look not quite great, but yeah, that's good. Oh, I keep forgetting. Hi, it's Adam. I'm in my cave. It is uh, 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 March 20th, 2020. And uh, I am building an Echo One. And contrary to Fark's delightful overselling of my skills, uh, I am not building it from random crap around my shop. I am building it from a kit that I bought online that is getting delivered a few pieces at a time once per month. When I am done with this Echo One, it is going to be large. It's going to be like, like that large. Oh, it's going to be so lovely. It's going to have working lights. And if it doesn't have lights on the dashboard, I'm putting lights on the dashboard. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if there's not lights in the pro, it come, there are some, I think, am I right? There are proton packs that are part of this. Hold on. No, that's issue two. Hang on. I think, I think. I think there's the gurney the proton packs sit on. Is it possible that there are not the, ooh, yeah, it's possible that there aren't proton packs for this. So I guess some of us will have to get on 
making a run of those ourselves. All right, we're gonna keep on hitting this with paint because I wanna get it really, really grimed up. Yeah, this is, these under engine parts. Yeah, so you may be sitting in the paint booth, all of us talking, really, a lot of the talking was Lauren Boat, who had the best stories, an amazing storyteller. But we'd all be sharing stories. Because you're just sitting there waiting, literally watching paint dry. But everything had to get done really quickly. Like, you've seen those shots of me and Corey working on the Topoka City building from episode two. The big, wide flying saucers with the tall caps that were high scale. Um, those had to be painted by the painting department, I think, in less than a week. That is a ridiculous amount of work in a crazy accelerated timeline. And they did it. Uh, but it's like you're just sitting there with a blow dryer all the time on each part, masking, painting, drying, masking, painting, drying, masking, painting, drying, moving on and on. I might have laid it on a little bit thick, but I'm pretty happy with that. So let's pull the wedge out of this guy and take a look at this step, which is EM screws. I don't know. No, a DM. A DM holds that to that. And it's this one. And this goes, yeah, if I put a thumbprint in it, I'm fine with that. Ooh, ooh, it's warm. Yeah, okay, so you'll see what I'm talking about here about painting things before assembly um, and exactly what it nets you. Oh, also the metal parts that I'm heating up with the blow dryer are actually really hot to the touch. <laughs> Ow. Adam, you were applying heat to metal. Why didn't you think it was gonna get hot? In answer, I just didn't realize it would get that hot. Okay. Still need to tighten the screw. One more. There we go. Nice and solid. Okay, so now you see this extra scale kind of look I got by painting these two things separately. I show this dividing line and that's going to add scale later on. That's that's going to be a nice bit of scale. I'll probably pull some of this paint off this middle section, but that scale is nothing but good for me. Um, okay, so that connects there. And then that was a DM screw. And that's that. And now I need two EM screws. There we go. One. And two. Um, don't worry. Uh, this is the last of this kit I have. And don't get me wrong. While I really hope that Eagle Moss wants to send me the entire thing at once so I can just start building the whole thing. Hey, Eagle Moss, I would. The fact is, I also have plenty of other things that I can build uh, while we're waiting for if when I finish these. I have lost my little brush. I've, been, I've lost my acid. Oh, there it is. I thought I lost my acid brush. thought I lost my mind. All right. Now we're just going to do this to bring the two pieces together a little bit. Yeah. It's, um, it's difficult at these stages of painting because right now it doesn't look like a thing. I have at least three more colors to add to make it look like the right kind of thing. But I can't add them immediately. I have to kind of wait. I have to give it some time. All right. So now there's this piece. This is the, uh, 
Oil pan. The oil pan. Okay. I'm just going to do a quick, I'm going to do a quick look for, uh, I just, I just want some reference here. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, Miller Meteor oil, oil pan. I just want to see what a, some reference for a Miller Meteor oil pan. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, ooh, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not looking necessarily for the exact one here, but I just kind of want to see how, uh, let's do 59 Cadillac uh, oil pen. Okay. That's the one. Right. Okay. Yeah. Rusty, grimy. Your basic deal. Cool. So I'm also going to hit this with some of this stuff, but I think I'm going to add just a little bit of brown, just, just to kind of break it up. I'm going to tip step over. That's kind of one of the things I do when I'm mixing. Yeah, I'm a drummer. You don't, I'm not actually a drummer. I don't know how to drum, but I am a drummer in that I am an annoying person who is kind of always tapping on surfaces. Uh, in 2002, before Mythbusters ever showed up, if you had asked Tori Beleche to do an impression of me uh, at ILM, his impression would have included that because that was apparently something I was doing all the time. I, I think I was a little annoying, pretty sure. All right, so got a little bit of that. Yeah, so this is the oil pan. It's made of plastic. And again, it's the right color blue. In fact, they've injection molded it in the exact right color, which is no small thing, to be honest. To match a color between a die cast part and a plastic part, that's, um, that gets my respect. I mean, yeah, that's 99.9%. .9%. That is a uh, it's really nice work, Eagle Moss people. All right, so this guy lives like that. And is it the, yeah, it goes like that. Okay, so yeah, let's say the oil pan is gonna look slightly different. Um, let me get a little bit of grime on there. I mean, what am I saying? We're going to get a lot of grime on there. And we're going to take some of that grime off. And then we're going to add some of this grime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. There we go. Sometimes just getting that other color nearby and then getting it on your brush so it can start to add some tonal changes is enough. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll let that one sit there and dry this guy off because that's a lot of heavy paint. And I'm going to keep on pulling it off here. I'm going to keep on removing it and attaching it. Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, cool. That's looking pretty good. I'm going to... oh. Occupational hazard. Things move. All right. Let's uh, get that on my hand. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's a very lightweight. Whoa. Ah! In the in the manual of this, it says these parts are delicate, and you should do all your assembly over a soft cloth. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny because I'm like, yeah, no, that's not how this is gonna go. Um, let me get. I'm gonna same thing I did yesterday, where I took a Q-tip and I kind of 
abused it until it had a kind of a weird, funny head. I'm using that as a kind of way to sort of add some grime here. Yeah, so I'm just adding a little bit of... Grime detail and, and, and let's do, let's do, where's my turpentine? There you are, hidden behind my rag. Always like this. Hey, everybody. It is uh, Friday, March 20th, 2020. Um, I am here in my cave and uh, I am live streaming the build the building of a uh, the building of a ecto one uh, 1959 miller meteor ambulance hearse uh to give you some place to go i know that we are all cooped up in our houses uh and that is a less than ideal situation um and i'm sorry about that so uh, because we're all in this together I am doing these builds from my cave and we'll be doing this on the regular. So now I'm adding some, oh, I'm adding some rust to my oil pan in the oil paint. And oh man, I'm really pleased with how this is going. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it where the rust would gather. And I'm going to try and be a little random about it. Remember I said humans are terrible about being random. They totally are. The oil paint won't dry as fast as the lacquer, not by, I mean, by leagues. Literally, one is meant to dry fast and the other is meant to take forever to dry. Uh, but it will, that, that, you know, those different drying times gives me all sorts of different freedoms for playing around with the textures and adjusting, pulling it back. Okay, so I don't love that. Let's see here. I wonder. Ah, let's see about this. I'm just a. Uh... Oh, okay. That was terrible. <laughs> I was trying a little bit of lacquer thinner on it and pulled off way too much paint. That was that was that was problematic. So I'm gonna add a bunch. Yeah. No, so now I've started to move the paint around a lot. You know, while I've got this uh, brush with some of the with some of the brown oil paint on it, I'm uh... no, that's lacquer thinner. I'm getting my solvents mixed up. That's what I want. You live over there. All right. Yeah, there we go. I'm also going to add some rust accents to this guy here. Mm. Oh, this is my favorite part. Just all the different car engines I've looked at and the way they looked inside. You know, there's no right way to do this kind of paint job. There's just a way that ends up feeling right. Also, there's a great way to kind of see how it feels right. And that is, do you believe it? And like, part of that is composition, right? The composition of the dirt you're putting on. Uh, but how do you tell whether the composition of the dirt is working in your favor or not? Well, that's why you have to kind of take a step back and take a look at it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at this bell housing, for instance, like right here. I'm looking at that part. And I'm thinking, you know, the long spines could be a place where water collects and rust could gather. So I add a little bit of rust there on the sides. And I'm really pleased with how that looks. And all of a sudden, now I'm starting to see that it's telling me the story that I want it to tell. And that's all that this process is, is I'm just sort of like 
doesn't communicate the story that it's a dirty piece of metal, that it's human sized and that it's undergone similar things to other things that I've seen weathered and beaten up. Um, there's not a ton. I'm not doing a huge amount of rust dust, although I will add a, a kind of a singular rust patch at some point because those can be really useful. And I'll add a secondary color because again, like I said, no, no paint job is a single color. I know I'm dipping my paint filled thing in the turpentine. I know, but since I mostly use this, use this for weathering, I, I think we're okay on that front. All right. That was no good. That was bad. That was a bad call, Ripley. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to do a big, big patch right there. Cool. All right. I feel, I feel like this is, I still haven't, there's still a couple more passes to do. But again, we're getting closer. So now the oil pan goes in and the oil pan sits that little nubbin that way. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing about this oil pan the oil pan's made of metal, and the rest is too, but the oil pan tends to get a little more abuse than the rest of it. So I actually want to do a little rub and buff here. I'm going to use the silver leaf rub and buff, and I'm just going to put a little bit out here. I'm going to get some on my Q-tip, and I'm going to hit the high spots of my oil pan with a rub and buff. And this will make it feel more metallic. Okay, so let's show you the control. This is the oil pan. Hang on. Yeah, pretty good. Okay, this is, look at the lighting. See that? See, look at this. I'm bringing you production value today. That is the oil pan before I've done this metallic pass. And get some again, some rub and buff on my on my Q tip, and I'm just gonna hit the high points here and some of the bolts with the metal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh rub and buff. You are so Amazing. Oh, look at that. Like magic. Seriously. Seriously, when I show you this, your head's going to explode. It's so much fun. All right. So let's get some. Yeah, just going to make the corners stand out. Oh, dude. Oh, yes. All right. I know I'm making lots of exclamatory noises, but I really am having this much, this much fun with this. Okay. So here is the oil pan after I've given it that silver pass. I wish you could see it in person because it's, it's really good. <laughs> I'm really happy with that it came out. Okay, so oil pan goes on there, and there's an EM screw, and I think there's one sitting there. There it is. Okay, so EM screw goes on. And screwdriver. That's it. Okay, now I think I want to do a little more rubbing and buffing before I move on to... Yeah, that's okay. So that's the, that's the, oh, wow, we're doing a whole, a half of the engine. Nice. Okay, so now I think it's time to do some more weathering on this guy. Let's see how we're doing time. Uh, let's see. Oh, I can close that. Quit. Uh, good. Yes. I'm hearing that it's going well. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Adam Savage. Your host of what? Your host of whatever you want. Uh, I used to host Mythbusters, Mythbusters Junior. 
Unchained Reaction, Dangerous Toys, Savage Builds. Now I am hosting my own build of the Ecto-1 here in my cave. And the stage that we're at with this Ecto-1 is that I have assembled uh, part of the bell housing for the engine. And I've done a couple of rust passes. And I'm about to do, you know what? I'm about to actually do a black wash in acrylic. And that will be acrylic tubes. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So get a little acrylic tube. There we go. I have this particular thing. You heard that, right? You heard it went bunk, bunk, which meant it didn't make it where I was tossing it. I am like the anti step curry. If I aim for something, I'm going to miss it. Even if it's right here, if it's right here, I throw it. I'm like the opposite of the guy in Wanted. I can't hit a fly's wings off. In fact, if you showed me a fly and aim the gun, I would not be able to shoot its wings off. Not that I would want to, but it's, a, it's my point is that I like have this, this, uh, this, I have this particular superpower and that I can't hit a basket no matter what. So there we go. There it went. Second time's a charm. I want to do a black wash on this because I'd like to pull out some of the details. I, I did a rust pass but it doesn't quite work. The oil pan looks great. I'm very happy with that, but the rest of it still could use a little work. I've got a little rubbing alcohol here. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna put some down on the sheet and I'm gonna get a little bit of paint in the alcohol. The rubbing alcohol helps the paint get really, really thin. And because the uh, rubbing alcohol is a different solvent that doesn't work as well on the lacquers, I can give a kind of a, a, a pass of the alcohol to this. And then when I hit it with some black paint as a wash, it'll settle into the corners. So the, the basically kind of the alcohol helps the black paint scale a little bit. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not positive that the rubbing alcohol isn't going to screw my lacquer paint job. Well, frankly, I'm kind of okay with that. There we go. Let's see. You know what I kind of want to do? I kind of want to hit this with compressed air. Ooh. That's kind of great. Um, that wasn't bad at all. The thing you don't want to do is like you don't want to use the same solvent that's working on your paint and then it's going to start yanking your old paint job off, right? You're happy with that paint job. Uh, yeah, so now I'm just going to like start to use some paint to haul out from separating details. Yeah, that's a little better. Now it's telling a story. Yeah, see, anytime you see a... Cool Look, mostly what I'm doing is I'm looking for the high spots. I'm looking for anything that catches my attention in the right way or the wrong way. And which one is the, is the, is the, whether it's right or wrong, that it's catching your attention for the right or wrong reasons. That's just something you learn over time. Um, but really any designer, when they're looking at anything is simply looking for the most obvious problem to solve and then moving on from there. Okay. That's better. I may have to tackle that again a little later, but that's not so bad. Okay, so now I want to do again the 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 the, the rubbing and the buffing. Is that the rub and buff pass? No, there it is. There's my rub and buff pass Q-tip. So we'll get that on the Q-tip, and now we're gonna just sort of hit the hit the high spots again. This is what's amazing about the rub and buff is when you put it on like this. This is a tech, this is a sort of a modified dry brushing technique. Is that you're laying a metallic sheen over a paint job, and yet the effect is that it looks like the metallic is being revealed under the paint job. That's the kind of magic trick that happens with rub and buff when you do it like this. Is because your Q-tip or your brush or rag that you've got the rub and buff on, because it's hitting the high spots, it's actually hitting the parts of your build that would have been worn down by average, by normal use. 
right? And therefore, when your eye looks at it, it tells this very convincing story to your eye that this is an old part that has been handled many times and is weathering so that the paint comes off and you can start to see the metallic sheen underneath. Now, I've worn out this Q-tip, so yeah, missed the garbage can right over there. That's my skill. All right. Oh, it looks like we're about to have a visit from my shop assistant. So now I want to do these guys, these the, the, the long lines on the bell housing. That is going to be, oh, look at you. Hi, Maggie. How are you, sweetie? She, uh, she has this preternatural ability to tell, to come over and tell me that it's time for her walk. She's been wondering why everyone's in such a weird mood. I wonder sometimes when dogs see humans, like, you know, I'm sure all of you dog owners out there, your dogs can tell that you're stressed, but they're not sure why. And they kind of, they're looking to you quizzically for like, what is the, <laughs> what's the frequency, Kenneth? They kind of, they want to know what's going on with you. All right. So now I've added a metallic pass to this. And I feel like now it's looking much more like an awesomely beat up piece of engine hardware. I know I've gone really overboard with this, but that's, that's my prerogative. Come here, sweetie. Come here. Come on. Oh, good girl. Come on. Oh, yeah. Hi, sweetie. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Um, we're going to wrap this up soon. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take you for a walk around the block. And then it'll be time for dinner. Oh, sweet. Oh. Um, she's an excellent shop assistant. She's getting, it used to be a few years ago, she did not like the sound of the tools and would basically like be standing by the door like, I don't want to be here. And so I didn't bring her to the shop for a long time. Uh, and then um, she went deaf. <laughs> yeah, which made her much easier to deal with, to be honest. Okay, so I'm going to put that there. I'm pretty happy with it. I could modify it and I might. But for right now, it's fine. Um, I'm not going to put too much away because we're just about to get back into this. Now, that, great. Missed again. This is the last tray. Tray number six of all of these parts. Stage six. Left engine block, dipstick, and ignition wire junction. Ooh, look at that. I've got a head cover. That's going to be fun. That's going to be fun. Okay, so the first piece is this piece, which looks like that. And then there's this thing, which goes there. And it's two DM screws. One and two. And that sits in the inside, yes. Okay. So... Here we go. Um, I don't know what you guys have been watching uh, lately to bide the time. Um, I myself have found tremendous solace from the incredible ensemble cast of The West Wing. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding that show. <laughs> uh, I think it should be classified as fantasy at this point. <laughs> Uh, but holy hell, does it make me feel good to watch it. Uh, we're in the middle of season four, Will Bailey's season, Josh Molina. Josh, I love you, man. I, I love you. I like particularly, I love Josh Molina from sports night. One of the greatest shows ever made. Uh, okay. So now we're attaching this one back, back here. And it goes to the. All right, so this is bilaterally symmetrical, and it's another DM screw and that sits right there. DM. Oh, my gosh. 
I had a lovely conversation just before I came on with Ken Pattengale, my friend who's uh, half of the Milk Carton Kids. Uh, he's in Nashville. Uh, I, Nashville. Hey, my heart is out to you, Nashville. Hit by a tornado and a coronavirus all within the same freaking month. Well, you learn a lot about people. Uh, all right. The next one, figure C, is each time. All right. That goes there. And then this comes. That goes in there. Like that. Oh. Okay. That, that I'm going to attach later because I'm going to paint that. Oh, that's the dipstick. Yeah, I'm definitely going to paint that. Let's see. How, how are we doing on time? We are 2.35. All right. We're going to do this for another 25 minutes until uh, 3 o'clock. And I'm going to do this next week. Uh, I'm not sure on what schedule. Maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm not sure. Um, but there will be more building here. And, like, I think... I'm not sure I'm going to get all this done today. I can still keep working on it. And again, maybe, maybe Eagle Moss. Hello. Maybe Eagle Moss wants to send me the rest of this kit. But that's fine if they don't. I can wait. I can wait. I'm a patient man. All right. Uh, uh, this is the exhaust manifold. And they've actually shot the exhaust manifold in a different color plastic, a more metallic color. That is really awesome. Uh, and this is the cylinder head cover. Is that what this is? Yeah, there it is. Okay, so yeah, let's see. I I think this is a case, right? That sits in there like that. Yeah, like that. But see, now I've got to make some choices about painting this mofo. And this one sits on... Where does it sit? It sits there? Yeah, it sits there. And then this goes on top of that. That's the cylinder head cover. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at this arrangement and I'm thinking it's time to, it's actually time to look at more engine pictures. Uh, so I have, ah, oh, my neighbor's having a smoke. I, I, can, I can smell my neighbor. Smokes outside, but it drifts in here. I always tell when it's happening. Okay, so the cylinder head covers are that blue. Yeah, uh, underneath that, eh, it's really hard to see. It's going to get covered by the ignition wires and the oil pump and the air filter. So you're not going to see a ton of that stuff. So I guess I could leave that and worry about painting it later. Igno the exhaust manifold should absolutely be a little more color varied. And in that regard, that one went in the garbage can and bounced right out. Okay, so I think I'm going to hit the exhaust manifold with a little bit of rub and buff. And maybe that's going to be enough for me on this one. And I'll just, like, I'll wait until I have the whole engine together. Because I'm definitely going to paint the cylinder head covers as more of a weathered metallic. And I may make the two of them look slightly different. Um so now I'm just hitting the exhaust manifold with a whole bunch of rub and buff. I'm not trying to be subtle about this. Um, what I am trying to do is make it look less monolithic, less like all one color. It's been shot in a plastic that's a slightly metallic color of plastic, which is good for accuracy. But the real world, most things, I said this yesterday, aren't all the same color. They're, they're variables. Um, so... Just by hitting this with a little rub and buff, um, I've made it look a little less uniform. Now that goes there, and this goes on with three AP screws. Hell's bells, Margaret. We haven't seen those in a while. One, two, three. Oh, 
Ah! Come now. Ah! Stop resisting! That's not a funny joke. Uh, all right, here we go. I don't know why this is being so recalcitrant. Okay, here we go. That's it. Ah, oh, I see. Right. The dipstick sits below the exhaust manifold. That's why it has to get painted like that. Okay, we're going to paint this dipstick. We're going to paint this dipstick. Uh, and we are going to do it with, do I have any flocal silver? Oh, no, 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 yes. We have the Molto liquid chrome. That's what we're going to do here. Yeah, we're going to make our, we're going to make our dipstick all chrome. I believe that's the subtitle of Mad Max Fury Road. I'll let you work it out. All right. Oh, man. This Molto Chrome is... You know what? After sitting like this, my back was killing me last night. I've been working hard today to sort of sit up straight. Uh, yeah, I had to take some ibuprofen and a hot bath and a heating pad last night. And I'll tell you about the heating pad. Maggie can smell from about six miles away that someone's plugged in the heating pad. And she, like, push you out of the way to get to that thing like one of her favorite things in the world she's sleeping on a sound blanket right now so i don't have to worry about the bottom of the dipstick because you're never going to see it i'm pretty sure And again, what I'm really trying to do is just to keep adding variation and variegation of the uh, on the paint job so that it feels more correct to scale. Yeah, that's just shoved in there. All right. Uh, oh, right. There's two more of these EM screws that go in here. EMs? No, APs. Ah, ah. I mean, now I was glad that it that they magnetized it because it held on to it and didn't let it go. So back on uh, in the old days of MythBusters, we uh, we did the episode about uh, pepper spray. Yeah, we did an episode about pepper spray, and in order to be able to work with pepper spray, they bought Jamie and I a pair of hazmat suits. Um, this was a full kind with a big hood and a big shield. And so for reasons that should be totally clear, I went to my storage space the other day to find that hazmat suit. And lo, <laughs> the bag is there that says Adam's hazmat suit. Inside it is the wrong hazmat suit. Shit. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was kind of surprised. So I don't have a hazmat suit. I thought I did. I was actually kind of really, you know, I like having, I like being well stocked. As you could imagine, it is, it is a key identifier to me. Uh, all right. So now this goes on. Right. Mm. Really? Okay. Yeah. I guess I have to put this on first okay that is the last part from this tray and another tray tray number six bites the dust and this has this it sits like that and oh okay there's this little tiny doohickey there where that lives yeah just like that and then this oh yeah so it has that high spot okay the cylinder head. Let's hit this with rub and buff. Ah, uh, let's hit it with some rub and buff. Uh huh. I think a little bit of lacquer thinner. Yeah. Yeah, rub and buff dissolves. Rub. I actually put the part in painting in my mouth. 
Okay, so lacquer thinner definitely thins out rub and buff. So I'm going to hit this with some lacquer thinner, excuse me, some rub and buff to make the cylinder heads look metallic. Yeah. And then I'll hit them with some rust. Nice. Oh, get some going there. Too, too. too much, too much. Too, too much. Excellent. Yep, yep, yep. Get it slightly more uniform. Yeah, that is looking like a part. Excellent. Okay, so I'm happy with that. I'm going to dry it out just a little bit. Now that we've rubbed it, we're going to dry it out and we're going to buff it. Hence the name. And then, yes, Maggie, we will go for a walk soon, I promise. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, that's actually pretty darn good looking. Take a look at that. That is, that's kind of great. I may change my mind about that later, but I, that's my prerogative because it's just some tiny screws holding it in. So, uh, this puppy goes, all right, let's see here. That puppy sits there and this sits on top of that. And these are BP screws, four of them. One, two, three, and four. Okay. One, a two, you know, I am a little surprised that at the end of the day, after all the episodes of Mythbusters we did, that we never did how many licks does it take to get to the center of a tootsie roll, of a tootsie pop. That just strikes me as an egregious dereliction of our duty. Um, we even talked about it at one point, about making a moisture, a constantly moisturized, motorized cow tongue that would lick a pop on a regular basis and that we would calibrate that to a human's i mean the machines that we could build for this would be disgusting in the best way we never got around to it again i i consider it a kind of a personal failing and i'm going to add a little more of this rub and buff here just a you know that's it ah Screwed it up. Screwed it up. Hold on. I need more. That's it. Okay. Better. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. All right. Now, now that I've got the brush all done, I'm going to kind of do some dry brushing here of the engine pieces. Yeah, that's good. And if I do the pieces that separate out from the other pieces, that actually should help me with some textural difference. Yeah, that looks great. So forgiving this process. Now, oh yeah, and I can do the same thing on this guy here. Again, as your brush dries, it just makes everything look even better. Oh, 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 come on, come on. Okay, now, two AP screws, AP. There we go, one, two, three, four. Excellent, and then this guy goes here. And right, there it is, okay, so. Ah, Let's see if I can get this in here. I have such giant hands, giant fingers. Oh, 
come on. I gotta get close to the light. Why is this so difficult? Ah! All right, I need a new approach. Ugh. I need a new approach. So let's get one of these up on here. There we go. And then we'll bring it up to this. Hey, that worked! It's almost like they magnetized the screwdriver on purpose. Amazing! It's science. Oh. Okay, there we go. Second one is in. The second transport is away. Oh. Okay, we are doing really well here. Does this attach to the other thing? It does. Holy cow. Right, so now actually that we get to attach them, we need a DM screw. And that is this one. Uh, they've been very generous with the screws so far, I must say. Usually on the D'Agostini Falcon, each time you were done with the system, you'd end up with just like a couple of extra screws for each step. Um, you can go there. And you can move back there. Right, this guy. This guy sits like this. And this guy comes over here like this and lives like that yes 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 <laughs> okay so we'll get the dm screw on there and we'll get it up into the perfect dude it'll be real fun to add all the spark plug wires and everything to this later on once it starts to really get going but that right there is the rudiments of part of the engine of the Ecto-1. Let me just see how we're doing on time. Ah! Eight more minutes, that is delightful. Um, so I'm gonna use that time to shake up my grime, get a little bit of that on here. And in fact, I think I'm gonna try a little dry brushing of the grime. So I'm gonna go for a kind of a rough brush here gonna load it up and then I'm going to dry it off and just see about yeah uh-huh I'm just gonna see about getting the grime on here in a lighter pass mm -hmm. that's it yeah you know it's like your each of our intuitions about what would actually yield the best result. You know, I, I'm just guessing that I wanted a harder brush, but oh man, was I right. Yes, I wanted a harder brush for that. Um, it gives me a little more control over how the grime sets down. Uh, but I can also see I'm in desperate need of some rub and buff on this. Yeah, okay, let's get some grime on the front there. Uh, and I think actually, so yeah, I'm using two brushes now. One is the dry brush that puts on the grime and the other is just the one that moves it around a little bit uh, and creates a little more of a uniform, you know, you don't want anything that looks like a brush mark when you're doing this. So here, I'm just gonna show you up close, here we go. So this is a spot that I think could use a little bit of grime. So I'm gonna go in with the grime, see how heavy the grime is. Then I go in with a drier brush you see how much that kind of evens it out? And again, that's a fundamentally different texture than this. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for my textures to kind of keep telling me the story that this is an engine of separate component parts and pieces. And that is the story that I feel like it's telling me. So I'm pleased with it. Um, so here, I'll show this again. This, this part could use some grime. So I'm gonna go in with the grime. There it is, that's really heavy grime. I'm gonna go in with a second brush that wasn't even dipped in paint, just happens to be dry. And then I'm going in and now I'm taking off some of that grime and I can even take more of it with the cloth off the high spots. Yeah, great. Okay, so now I think it's time for 
a little more rubbing and the buffing. The rubbing and the buffing. I sometimes like to lick my Q-tips before I dip them in the rub and buff. It just makes them a little more um, coherent, as it were. And I'm just going to be hitting some of this stuff, all the bolt heads. Again, it really can't be overstated how much doing a rub and buff pass on every bolt head on your model is like a radical improvement over not doing it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really have a complete idea for that sentence when I started it. Um, there we go. Oh, yeah. It's funny. It's like, are you ever going to actually open an engine with this many giant Phillips head screws? Probably not. Uh, yeah, let's get those caps going. Mm hmm. And, uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I think that is as reasonable a place to stop as any. We now have a uh, completed bumper with four of the fog lights wired up. We've got a hood with some excellent weathering, if I say so myself, weathering that I am very pleased with, let's say, on the front and the back. And again, there are many, 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 many more months of pieces of this kit to assemble, but uh, this is the first bit. The next thing that will happen is that off camera, I will build a box that sort of holds this project and allows me to put it away for periods of time and then pull it back out. I'll probably build a foam core tray, to be honest. Probably about the size of this table and about five inches high um, with some handles on the side. And that'll allow me to kind of keep these parts together because I'm going to put this away for whatever, a month before the next pieces arrive, if they do. Uh, and this is one of my key project management techniques is making custom boxes for stuff. So often the first pass is that stuff will go into a regular cardboard box so I can just keep it all together. And then as I get to understand the project and I see the periodicity that I'll be working with it, that's when I start to build custom cases for it. Uh, and that just, that makes picking up a project much easier. Uh, thank you for joining me, everybody. This was a real pleasure. And if I'm counting correctly, we did not have a single buffer today. So all of your helpful suggestions yesterday were gangbusters, and maybe even we can turn on chat next time we do this. I am um, I am delighted to be able to work a little bit alongside you all in your houses and your homes and your hotels and all the places you might be stuck, stranded, or sequestered. Um, again, it's vital that we social distance. We have to flatten the curve of this thing if we're going to make it through this, and we will make it through this. It's going to it's going to be tough, but we will make it through this. Thank you, everybody. It is my pleasure to invite you into the cave for a couple of hours, and I'll do it again next week. Uh, look for my Twitter feed and my social channels for the announcement of the schedule. And probably once we've got it in burned in next week, we'll keep on going on that schedule until somebody tells us not to, or there becomes another kind of lockdown. In that case, we'll end up in my house, and I'll be building in my house uh, on multiple days per week. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Wear your masks. Wear your gloves. And uh, keep supporting each other. Bye, everybody. All right. Uh, let's see. How do I stop this? There.